It's a good day. It's the day the Lord has made. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, I wanted to share with you about a year ago, uh, I first heard this song. Um, the title of it is Already All I Need. And what had happened is uh, my wife and our oldest daughter were were shopping at a, at a Christian bookstore in Camp Hill. And um, I was done looking at what I was looking for, and I was just standing by a big rack of CDs waiting on them, and I would pick up a couple from time to time and look at them, put them back, and about the third or fourth time I did that, I picked up four or five, and I got to this one, and the Lord said, you need that. I said, okay, Lord, so I just bought it out of simple obedience, and she was, uh, our daughter was here from California, and we were quite busy for a while, so I, I didn't even open it for about two weeks. And uh, I opened it and played the CD, and I realized that I really did need that. And I, it just blesses me, and I've been able to share it with others and bless them. But it's called Already All I Need. And I just want to read the first uh, couple of lines, the first couple of lines of the lyrics to, uh, for you. Asking where you are, Lord, wondering where you've been, is like standing in a hurricane trying to find a wind. Think about that for a second with me. I, I, I thought about that, and I started to chuckle, and then I got a, a belly laugh out of it, and I said, my Lord, my Jesus. Asking where you are, asking where you've been, it's like standing in a hurricane trying to find the wind. How ironic. You know, he's as close. He's as close as our next breath. Jesus is as close as our next breath. Glory to his holy name. Hallelujah. You know, in that mighty name of Jesus, when you pray, you're through. You have already made it through. Hallelujah. He sits by the right hand of the Father and, and intercedes for you and me 24 hours, 7 days a week. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. If there's anyone that deserves to be lifted up, it's Jesus. I want to ask you something. Don't you love him tonight? Amen. Hallelujah, I love him tonight. He is so worthy. Lord Jesus, my goodness. There's no little insignificant thing that can happen that should take my focus off of him. He is our focus. He is our life. You know, if he never answered another prayer, it would be okay. I'm telling you, he's already done enough. Missing hell is enough. But he doesn't stop there. But I want you to know that if he doesn't ever answer another prayer for you, he's still worthy of your praise and your glory and your honor. Hallelujah. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Hallelujah. You know, I've run into some people, that's all I can pray for them anymore is, Father, just draw them to you. The Lord said, if, if the Father doesn't draw them, they can't come. Draw them to you, Father God. Glory to God. Jesus paid for every sin of all mankind. Can you imagine that? All of it. It is finished. Hallelujah. In John chapter 4, Jesus said to his disciples, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Jesus was very busy that day, and the disciples were talking among themselves and saying, Golly, did anybody give him anything to eat? Did you eat, Lord? And he replied to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing of. And later on in verse 34, he said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. I sat and I, I thought about that, and I prayed about those scriptures. I meditated on those scriptures, and I, I then realized something. My food, he said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. You know, I could go to a hundred church meetings like this. I could read a dozen very good godly books about him. I could pray praise and worship music 24-7, and I could still be unfulfilled and hungry. Do you know that? But you know what fulfills the longing in my soul? Doing the will of my Heavenly Father. And that comes from just being 
who I am in Him. You know, before the foundation of the world, He knew you. He said, I knew you before I formed in your mother's belly and I ordained and sanctified you before you came out of the womb. He wasn't talking just about Jeremiah. Jeremiah was ordained a prophet to the nations. But each one of us has a destiny in God that he had before the foundation of the world. Think about that. Think about the reality of that. And he still has faith that each one of us is going to complete that destiny in him. Oh, my gosh. Woo, Jesus, my Lord. And you know what? Nobody's destiny is any more important than anybody else's. We've got to quit thinking carnally. We need to start thinking more eternally. I used to tell them years ago, I I don't tell them much anymore, but I said, listen, if when I go to be with the Lord, I don't want you moping around and and having a fit. I hope you miss me, but I want you to have a praise and worship service and peel the paint off the wall. Why? Because I have seen him face to face. It gets better. Eternal. Eternal thinking. Knowing that I'm doing his word, not just hearing it, gives me the confidence that I truly do have a relationship with the one I unashamedly love, Jesus. He said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. And you know what? Jesus wants you and me and all of us to follow him. He wants followers. He wants disciples, those who continually learn of him and grow in him and let him teach them, walking with him every day. It's almost on every page of this book, is it not? And I believe I have a word from the Lord for us tonight. I think he wants to instruct us. He wants to instruct and put us in remembrance of things about our attitudes. You know, his love for every one of us is unwavering. It's never changed. It's never changed whether you did or didn't do something, whether you obeyed or didn't obey. His love is never ending. He is love. Is he not? He's worthy of my love. Hallelujah. Father, Father God considers you and me the best part of his creation. He really does. He chose us. He chose us to be his sons. He chose us to be his heirs. He chose us to be joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He is the first fruit of the resurrection. It says the first of many brethren. I wonder who some believers think that is. (laughs) The way they act. Why so downcast, oh my soul? It's us. It's us. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Those of us who are saved by the precious blood of the Lamb. And I want you to know that he wants to talk to us about attitudes, but he's not angry. He's not, he doesn't want to rebuke us tonight. He doesn't even want to, to uh, admonish us mildly. He simply wants to instruct us about some things that he's interested in today. I like to call them kingdom attitudes. Attitudes for walking in the kingdom. Jesus taught us to pray, Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Things are settled in heaven. They're not settled on earth yet. Everything that can be shaken is being shaken. Amen? And Father is the one doing the shaking. Some people call them end time attitudes. That probably would offend some people, but we are in the end time. Amen? 2 Timothy chapter 3 says this, verse 1. Know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. We're going to stop there. You can go back and read all those things there in verses 2, 3, 4, 5. Terrible things there that, say, that says blasphemers, boasters, unloving, unforgiving, traitors. <coughs> Lovers of self and not lovers of God. Lovers of self, not lovers of others. You know what? 
That's not a coincidence that that's the first thing on the list. I'm sure of that. I'm positive of that. That's, that's there for a reason. Men will be lovers of themselves, not lovers of God or others. Uh, be honest with me. Do we see that today in the United States of America? Do we see all these things in here? As I said, we're not going to go down that whole list. But we see it every day, do we not? So I have a question. How important is it for us believers to have and to maintain proper attitudes as we walk in the kingdom today? How important are they? You know, for example... Excuse me. For example, I've, so far I've got 21 attitudes that the Lord has shown me that He's concerned about. Like I said, tonight we're going to talk about the number one attitude. But, you know, I need to have and maintain an attitude of walking in love. I need to, to have and maintain and strengthen my attitude of walking in the truth. Of walking in patience. Do I not? What about, what about the attitude of being a good steward of what he's already given me? That hits home, doesn't it? He's not going to give me any more if I can't handle what he's already given me, amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Here's one. What about submitting to all authority? All authority is of God. Now, have there been abuses in this area? And in the body of Christ, yes! My goodness, yes! But that's no reason not to obey this word. It says all authority is of God. You know, if I'm going down 81, 75 miles an hour, and the Holy Ghost says, you need to slow up, Dave, and I just blow right through that, I'm going to tell you what, one of God's civil authorities is going to come and stop me, and he, his authority is of God. Oh, yeah. I know a young man in Kansas who's a state trooper, and people were asking him, well, how do you operate when you're out there on the, on the turnpike and, and all that? How do you respond to people, uh, particularly speeders? And he said, well, I have a rule of thumb. He said, we all kind of do. We all go by the same thing. He said, I'll, I'll give you eight. So in other words, if the speed limit is 60, he'll give you 68. That's pretty good. I mean, when you think about it, he wouldn't have to. But he said, if you're going 9, 69, then I'm going to put the red light on and the siren, and you're going to get, you're going to get a ticket. The saying he goes by is, 8, you're great, 9, you're mine. Yeah, 8, you're great, 9, you're mine. That's the rule of thumb. That's pretty generous. Really, when you think about it, submit to all authority. Keep your confidence in God. He is our confidence. My confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ is yours, isn't yours. Don't lose your confidence. Don't let something, you know, why, like I said, why so downcast my soul? Why so roller coaster up and down? We are saved by the precious blood of Jesus. We are going to see him face to face soon. And we're going to be with him forever and ever. We're going to rule and reign with him a thousand years on this earth. And then we have forever and ever and ever and ever to be with Him, glory to God. I love that song, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing His praise than when we first begun. That's eternal. That's not carnal thinking. <laughs> We're going to be with Him forever, glory to God. Praise your holy name. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is is Lord. What about the attitude of, of, of laying all those hindrances, and we have them, aside and look to Him. Look to Jesus. He can be counted on. You know, one thing He said was, in this world you will have tribulation. Remember that? You will have trouble. But you know what the number one meaning of that word tribulation is in the Greek? Pressure. In this world, you will have pressure. And you know what? When I get under pressure, that's when my real character comes out. Huh? And then he was quick to add, but be of 
of good cheer, why? For I have overcome the world. Glory to God. He wants to help us. You know, he said, without me, you can do nothing. Do you believe that? I do too. But just like this, he wants to help us with one attitude in particular. I can't do it without him, but with him I can. And he simply wants to train us and teach us about that. And that attitude is put off all complaining or put off complaining in all forms. Put off the spirit of complaining and put on the spirit of thanksgiving. I said, he's not angry. He's not rebuking us. He simply wants to instruct us. Turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus 15. We're going to look at some complaining. Exodus chapter 15, we're going to start verse 22. Exodus 15, 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them and said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A month had passed from the time that the Israelites departed Egypt and they reached the wilderness of sin and water was already a problem. Now in the beginning of chapter 16, we're going to see that they've run out of food. And they were really afraid. They were really scared. They were frightened to the extent that they began to think about the good old days (laughs) back in the slave camps of Egypt, for goodness sake. They were slaves. They were thinking about the good old days. Look at this. Exodus 16, verse 2. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, and the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly, with hunger. (laughs) You know, they had barely gotten started and they were already discouraged. They were given up. They'd been on the road a few days and they missed a meal or two and they were ready to go back to the slave camps of Egypt. I wrote a little sentence. I said, their growling stomachs produced complaining, grumbling lips. Their growling stomachs produce complaining, grumbling lips. I want to look at five things that this passage that we just read shows us about complainers. And, you know, like I said, the Lord's not mad, but he is talking to us. He's talking to believers. (laughs) Amen. Amen. Complainers always find something to complain about. 16, verse 1. They journeyed from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them 
whether they will walk in my law or not. You know, it seems that they've learned nothing from their past experience of God's faithfulness and care for them, doesn't it? And quickly they've returned to self-pity, complaining, and grumbling. But you know, I thought about this, and, 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 and we must admit that in times of despair, uh, when we're faced with difficulties, we complain if we personally can't solve the problem, don't we? Now, as I said, with the Lord's help, and he wants to help us with this. This is one thing he wants to help those of us in the body of Christ. Because my brothers and my sisters, I want to tell you something. The truth is that some Christians make complaining and grumbling an art form. They really do. No, I'm not mad and I'm not against them. I'm the first one to repent. What does that mean? That means I'm going one way and I turn and go 180 degrees the other way. Instead of complaining and grumbling, I, I, I'm thankful for what I have. Thankful for what I already have. I already have Jesus as my Lord and, and, and Savior. Hallelujah. But some people complain habitually more than others. Some Christians, amen? What do we complain about? I'll tell you one thing I was guilty of. I had to repent of, of, of complaining about slow traffic. You know what it's like. You're driving and somebody else is going down the road and they're, they're uh, talking on the cell phone, trying to correct the kids, eating a Big Mac, and driving down the road. I had to repent of complaining about that. What about this one? I've been in a restaurant already after church on Sunday. Oh, I feel so good. We went to church and did our duty and we're going to the restaurant. And, and Christians treat a waitress like she's a dog. Everything's wrong that they get, and then when they leave, they don't tip her anything. I wanted to disappear. Oh, God forgive us. Who do we think we are? Hey, what about the big one? What about the weather? What about the weather? It's too hot. It's too cold. It's too wet. It's too dry. I heard Christians just a couple months ago saying, That's it. I've had it. I'm not doing snow anymore. Well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Are you going to complain about it? Are you going to gripe about it, grumble about it? You're certainly not going to change it. Are you going to disappear? I don't think so. But the truth is, lots of things make us grumble and complain, and all I'm saying is the Lord is just telling us, my, my people, it shouldn't be that way. Let me help you. Let me help you. I want you to notice with me some of the characteristics of complaining and grumbling. Complaining is a gratitude problem. You know, it comes from a response to pain or to problems in this life. I mean, we, we really complain and grumble because we think that we should experience pleasure rather than pain and prosperity rather than adversity, don't we? After all, bless God, I'm a king's kid. That's true. But did you see what the king has done? Do you know part of your life is partaking of the sufferings of the king? See, I'm not going to sell a thousand tapes preaching this, but I've got to preach the truth. It is the truth. It's the Lord. He gave up everything he had in heaven for me. Oh, people make that real. Say that. Look in the mirror. and It, it wasn't for sister so-and-so and brother so-and-so. Yeah, he died for them, but he died for you. Each one of us. He loves us so much. Father God loved us so much that he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Think about that. What wisdom and knowledge and understanding. What love. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. His work was to do the will of the one who sent him and to, to complete his work. Amen? You know, when we're tempted to complain and grumble, we need to review the past. You know, review the past. See, law, stop and think about it and, and realize how much he has really blessed us. We are truly blessed. We really are. Sure, there's things wrong. Jesus said you're going to have trouble. 
But let's not concentrate on those things. Let's concentrate on what he's already done. You know, instead of complaining and grumbling, you should do something like this. Lord, what have I done that you've blessed me so much? Why have you blessed me so much, Lord? You know, you, you've given me a wife, you've given me children, you've given me a home, you've given me a job, you've given me everything I need at home, a lawnmower, or this, that, whatever. And the list, the list is unending. Why have you given me all these things, Lord Jesus? Why have you done that for me? Why was I born in America and not Bangladesh, Lord? Think about it. Yes, we're in times when, when America does not fear God properly. But it's still the best country to live in in the world, even today. If you don't believe that, go somewhere else and live for a while. Why me, Lord? How come I have good health, Jesus? Oh, yeah, I deal with this, I deal with that, but I know people who are my age and younger who have died of heart attacks. They've died of cancer. They're, they're crippled because of accidents and, and disease and all that. Why have you spared me from all these things? You know, when I think of all the ways he's blessed me and be honest about it before him, I wonder how I possibly could complain about the, the insignificant things that go wrong in my life from time to time. <laughs> Isn't that true? Golly. I remember a story my pastor used to tell. I, I've known it, I guess, about 20 years. And then the man he was talking about was in his 80s. His name was Brother Busick. And uh, Brother Busick and some other ministers were going to a meeting one day. They all piled in one car, about five or six of them. And uh, they started down the road. And they got down the road a couple of miles, and they had a flat tire. So they all jumped out, and they're walking around looking. One guy's jacking up the car, and the other guy gets the, the lug nuts off, and Brother Busick's walking around the car, and he says, Well, praise the Lord! And one of the younger ministers went over and patted him. He said, Brother Busick, uh, why would you say that right now? He said, we, we just had a flat tire. He said, Brother, it could have been all four. <laughs> praise the Lord, he's worthy. Listen, I had to repent of that. There was, a, there was a time in my life when I ruined my whole day. And she can tell you it's true. Hey, listen, I run into Christians, it would ruin their whole week. Huh? Had a flat tire and then, oh my gosh, everything went wrong the rest of the day. No. No. Could have been all four. I love him. I love him. The second thing that this passage shows us that is complaining is a perception problem. Complaining causes you and me to distort the facts. And right along with that, there is an exaggerated memory of the past. We've already seen that. The children of Israel exaggerated in their minds the benefits of Egypt. The good old days? I don't think so. They said they sat by their flesh pots and ate all they wanted. I don't believe that. I think that was an exaggeration of the past. How about you? They were slaves, for goodness sake. It couldn't have been true. They, they conveniently forgot about the, what they ate. They conveniently forgot about the lash of the taskmaster. And what about the anxiety they had, the anxiety in their hearts about wanting to be free? They forgot all about that while they're doing that back-breaking work of the Pharaoh. And their perception here of the imminent danger of starvation was also greatly, greatly exaggerated. The third thing this passage shows us is that com uh, complaining is a contagious problem. Verse 2, you read it with me twice. The whole congregation of the children of Israel complained. What started with a couple soon infected all of them. They were all contaminated. And I want you to know that complainers have already failed the test. Verse 4, the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Hey, God said, I'm going to meet your need for hunger, but in the meeting of that need, it's going to bring another test. 
Have you ever found that to be true in your life? I have. You know, in the midst of a predicament, we can't escape. We cry out, and Father gives us a way out. Amen? We accept his answer. We accept the new direction. But then that introduces us to a whole new set of trials of a different kind. Isn't that true? So while we're relieved of our wilderness problem, now we have a new problem. According to verse 4, the daily gift was intended to what? Be a test. Gathering manna was a test of their obedience. This passage also shows us that complainers are always looking for someone to blame. (laughs) Couldn't be me. Me? I couldn't be wrong. They accused Moses of leading them into the wilderness to kill them. And you know, the sad thing was is they thought they were just venting their frustrations against a man. But in reality, they were complaining against God. Verse 6 of chapter 16 says this, Then Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, At evening you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your complaints against the Lord. But what are we that you should complain against us? Also, Moses said, this shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and in the morning bring to the full, bread to the full. For the Lord hears your complaints, which you make against him. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. Moses clearly told them and showed them that complaining was not a protest of his leadership. They were protesting Father God's leadership. The two last things that we learn from this passage is that complainers are never satisfied with what they get, and also they're never satisfied with how much they get. Look at verse 13. So it was that quails came up at evening and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, There on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. Father said, I'm going to meet your need for food. It will come from heaven for you. Now, Psalm 78 calls manna angel's food. Angel's food. Every morning, this heavenly food was spread out on the ground, and the Israelites had nothing to do but just go get it. Go get it and eat it. They didn't have to work for it or anything else. But you know what? They still didn't like it. (laughs) They still didn't like it. The manna was described as having appeared as flakes or small round grains. In in verse 31 of 16, Exodus 16, it says, And the house of Israel called its name manna, and it was like white coriander seed, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. That sounds like angel's food, doesn't it? Uh, Yeah. Yeah, it does. Wafers made with honey. But now let me run over here quickly to, to Numbers 11 and tell you what the Israelites thought about it. Now listen to this. Verses 5 and 6. We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. You know, sometimes even when God's people are fed in abundance, they complain and grumble. Why? Why? You know why they do? Because what Father gives them is not what they prefer. What God gave them, they didn't prefer. They wanted steak, not hamburger. 
They didn't want the manna. Complainers are never satisfied with what they get. And they're never satisfied with how much they get. Look at this in uh, 16, verses 16 to 20. This is a thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need. One omer for each person according to the number of persons. Let every man take for those who are in his tent. Then the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less. So when they measured it by omers, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Every man had gathered according to each one's need. And Moses said, Let no one leave any of it till morning. Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses, but some of them left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. They feared starving, didn't they? There was plenty for all of them. God met their need. There was plenty. But you know what? They weren't only guilty of complaining. They were guilty of being greedy. They tried to hoard it. So they're guilty on two counts, greed and complaining. (coughs) Isn't that true? Do you know there was, it's estimated that there were two million, excuse me, two million million Israelites came out of Egypt. That was the estimate of how many came out. They had 600,000 men who were fit and ready to go to war. They had 600,000 soldiers. And an omer was to be gathered for each one of the Israelites. And an omer is equivalent to six pints. So that's 12 million pints a day. That, and that equals 9,000 pounds, which is four and a half tons. <coughs> they gathered four and a half tons of manna every day. That means there was over a million tons gathered in one year. I think Father was very generous. What do you think? Can you imagine? I can't even imagine a million tons. And listen to this. Verse 35 says, And the children of Israel ate manna 40 years. Until they came to an uninhabited land, they ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. 40 years. That would be over 40 years million tons of man. I think God was very generous. What do you think? Oh, my Lord. Thank you, Jesus. But, you know, as I was reading all this, I noticed a couple of things. We need to look to the Lord every day for our supply. I say we need to look to the Lord every day for our supply. They were told that this supply would come from heaven for you. The manna was gathered daily, wasn't it? You know, I can't live on yesterday's blessing. It'll still bless me. It'll still bless you. But I need something today. I need something from the living God today. You need something from the living God today. You need something from Jesus today. Hallelujah. Something fresh. I'm dependent on him each day if I'm walking properly with him. Amen? Because I'm going to tell you what. I guarantee you something's going to arise every day to test whether I'm going to depend on him or not. And you can say the same thing. Amen? It's a daily dependence. To feed on Christ is the only source of strength and blessing. Hallelujah. In John, Jesus described himself as what? The bread of heaven. He described himself as the bread of heaven to meet physical needs and also to give eternal life. You know what? We must put off complaining in all forms. We must replace the spirit of complaining with the spirit of thanksgiving. I want to read quickly for you, uh, from Philippians chapter 2. It's uh, Paul wrote to the church at Philippi when he was in prison the first time in Rome, and he, this is an admonishment. You know, we talked earlier that Jesus just wants to share with us tonight but Paul was actually 
cautioning them. He was actually reproving them gently. Um, and in verse uh, 14 of chapter 2, he says this. Philippians 2, chapter 14. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. I'm reading from the New King James. He said, without complaining and disputing. The King James says, murmurings and disputing. You know what? Murmurings, grumblings, complaining, grumbling is all the same thing. They're synonymous. It's all the same thing. Disputing means debating or deliberating an inward reasoning or opinion suggesting separation. In other words, what I take from that is you can prove, you can use the word of God and prove me wrong, but I'm still going to reserve the right to believe what I want to believe. Been there, done that, it's it's death. Amen? Amen? Amen. The Amplified Bible puts it really, really clear. Do all things without grumbling, fault-finding, and complaining against God. That doesn't leave anything for the imagination, does it? Do all things without grumbling, fault-finding, complaining against God, and questioning and doubting among yourselves. (coughs) We must put off complaining in all forms. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalm 144, verse 14 says that there be no complaining in our streets. That there be no complaining in our streets. I love Lamentations 3. I admit I don't go there too often in Lamentations. But Lamentations 3, verses 39 to 41 says this. Why should a living man complain? Let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. Hallelujah. That's the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. We should do the exact opposite. We should rejoice and laugh. (laughs) Rejoice and laugh. You know, Father laughs at his enemies. Father looks down and laughs at his enemies. Hallelujah. Let's replace the spirit of complaining with the spirit of thanksgiving. You know, it's an attitude of expressing gratitude and saying thank you to a merciful Father, is it not? We are daily loaded with His benefits. You go read Psalm 68, verse 19, Psalm 103, verse 2, and Psalm 116, verse 12. He has dealt with us bountifully. He's treated us so well. He's bestowed so much on us, people. You know, thankfulness is a choice. Gratitude is a choice. It's a deliberate act of my will. He's not going to make me be thankful and grateful, is he? No, he doesn't make me do anything. But don't you just love him for what he's done already? Like I said, if he never answered another prayer, Jesus has already done enough for me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, it's letting go and letting God be in control. It's it's trusting him with my past, my present, and my future. Is it not? You know, but it's easier to be negative. It's easier to say, well, what if... What if this happens, or what if that happens, or what, what if, no, no. You know what, a couple of months ago, didn't we have a government shutdown? The United States of America, we had a government shutdown. That was, that was something that was unconscionable just 20, 25, 30 years ago. Never heard of such a crazy thing. The United States government has shut down. But you know what, I was sitting thinking about it, and I thought, hey, You know what? The sun came up just like it always did. Those birds were out there singing beautifully like they always do. I still had a cup of coffee with my breakfast. I have a roof over my head. I got clothes to wear. I got a a bed to lie on, a comfortable chair, a warm house, laughter. I got my wife. I got my kids. I got my friends. 
Glory to God. And the list goes on and on. Huh? Yeah. You know what? It is difficult to be thankful and afraid at the same time. It's difficult to be thankful and intolerant at the same time. It's difficult to be thankful and violent at the same time. It's difficult to be thankful and greedy at the same time. It's difficult to be thankful and bossy at the same time. And it's difficult to be thankful and non-caring at the same time. Thankfulness keeps things in perspective. Gratitude keeps things in perspective. Let's focus on Him and let's focus on all the blessings, all the wonderful things He has bestowed upon us. In closing, let's read Psalm 100. Psalm 100. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with thanksgiving. Excuse me. Come before His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Putting off complaining in all forms is a key attitude for today. The Lord is concerned with that attitude today. He wants to help us with it. So let's put off the spirit of complaining and put on the spirit of thanksgiving. Amen? Father, we just come in that mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I just thank you for everyone here, everybody watching. And Lord, I thank you, Jesus, that you are our helper. And with you, I can do this, Jesus. We can do this. Without you, we can do nothing. But with you, With you, Lord, we can do whatever you want. And Lord, our food is to do the will of him who sent us and to accomplish his work. For Father's glory, for his praise, and for his honor, Lord, in your name, Jesus, in the name that's above every name, amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.